Well, welcome to another edition of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. My guest today really needs no introduction, uh, the Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes, who is the Moderator General of the Presbyterian Church of Australia, also the uh, Lecturer in Church History at Christ College and the Minister at Reevesby Presbyterian Church. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> uh, now, you've been Moderator General now for, what, you're halfway uh, through your tenure? Uh, not quite, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's been like in 1939 and 1940, it was the phony war. This is like being the phony <laughs> moderator general because uh, nobody wants to talk to me, uh, wants me to talk. I can't go anywhere. Last Sunday, I went to Hurstville, uh, and that was one of my first tasks. So I had to travel from Reesby to Hurstville uh, to ordain two elders. <laughs> That's my... So uh, that was nice to be there, mm. uh, but I'm not going anywhere else, but, you know, Victoria and yeah, Elsewhere. COVID twenty twenty has been really the year of disruption. Yes, um, yes. Well, that, that's the excuse they're using. So. <laughs> now, I, I want to um, get your perspective on uh, things as the moderator general, but in particular, you've written, I think, a fascinating article in RTR about the history of pandemics. Mm. Uh, your great passion and, in and interest is in church history. What are some of the lessons do you think that we can learn? from how Christians in the past have handled pandemics? Because there's obviously nothing new under the sun. This is not the first pandemic mm. to arrive. How have Christians responded in various ways throughout the centuries? Well, that, that's the big question. <laughs> that's a huge question. Uh, I'm no expert in pandemics, so uh, that's the first thing. The, the article was put together because I had to speak somewhere on, the, on this issue. And, and so it was cold from here, there, everywhere, just my reading down through the years. Um, so there's a limited amount of expertise in it, I'll point that out. Uh, and it just went through the early period, the medieval period, the Reformation period and post-Reformation period. And only went up to this so-called Spanish uh, flu of 1918, 1919. And so I didn't touch COVID. Um, and, of course, these were different. Uh, pandemics and epidemics uh, the, these were different plagues so uh, for ex the, the classic plague you know, the bubonic plague the black death you know 1347 48 49 particularly was at its height uh, in Europe was that the bubonic plague and uh, the mortality rate was was huge like you know, uh, a third 40 percent of Europe uh, some historians even estimate up to 50 percent of Europe died. So the population of Europe went down by about 20 million from 1300 to 1400. So you're talking about something quite devastating. In so far uh, uh, with COVID, uh, there's been nothing like that. So there's been a, quite a response to it, and you could well argue that the response has, has curbed it. But um, more people have died of the flu than in, in most years than have died of COVID. Certainly in Australia, Australia is remote, um, so it doesn't figure in the early. Well, ap apart from the uh, when I dealt with the Spanish flu, it didn't figure in the essay at all. Um, but Australia being isolated, I so far in the Spanish flu and with COVID uh, has not had the effects you know, suffered the effect. Yeah, it that seems others. that the severity of COVID in Europe and in yeah. in, in and in the United States <coughs> is much more severe. Um, I was looking at the figures the other day. I think about fifty, sixty thousand 60,000 people normally die of the flu each year mm. in America. I think the figure's up over, over 230,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. now. So it is quite... And in, and in Europe, we're seeing a second lockdown. Yeah. Um, now there uh, was, that, that was another thing too. They come in waves and we don't know where we are. Yeah. Um, all I think probably fair to say all of the plagues and epidemics and pandemics have coming wave so there's a second and third wave the spanish flu the first wave in australia uh we would hardly have noticed it i think okay it was so they knew it was there and they knew it was virulent because of what had happened in europe right uh, and uh so they were fearful of it and quarantine people but uh it the first wave did not kill many uh it was the second wave which was far more virulent the third wave more virulent still and then then it died out and and uh mm. And that was the end of it. Not is that a good thing. warning for us as a church not to be complacent with this? Uh, I think that would be certainly one of the lessons <laughs> um, that we don't know where we are. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So mm. 
uh, I don't think the medicos know. Mm. So certainly someone who's not a medico ought to be a bit wary of saying he knows where it's all going. I think there's good arguments for saying that, uh, yeah, eventually you might have to tough this out uh, and that's the only way you'll, the waves will stop. That, mm. uh, or we wait till a vaccine. Or, you know, mm. so this <laughs> it seems to me um, a big issue that's going to come up there is um, vaccines and their compulsion. Mm. Um, how do you think that needs to be handled pastorally in terms of freedom of conscience. Any thoughts there? Oh, well, vaccines that use uh, aborted fetuses is a real issue, yeah, a real moral issue. And uh, I would think Christians should take the strong line there. Uh, even though the the, fetus, the children haven't been aborted for that sake. Uh, mm -hmm. it, but, you know, Planned Parenthood and the rest of them made money out of this. And uh, it's a thriving industry. Mm. And and yeah, it's a disgrace that mm. that uh, this has happened, uh, and um, so that's an issue. Um, the issue for others, I, I mean, I don't have any troubles with vaccines as such. Uh, after that, um, but there were some people who who don't like them. There were some people, of course, who will react to them medically, and they, uh, that sometimes they don't know that they're going to until after, but. Uh, there will be some people who would know of people who have suffered because they've ta having a vaccine and they've reacted to it badly. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need 100% of the population to be vaccinated for it to be effective. To uh, reach herd immunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be inclined just to, uh, if you've got a good case, argue it and get it out there. Don't coerce people because you fear coercion by the government. Government coercion is... Not benevolent. Mm. Yeah. yeah, what was that great quote you were telling me the other day about Ronald Reagan? Um, uh, the, one, <laughs> the one thing about... <laughs> the frightening thing in the English language. Is, you're here from the government and I'm here to help you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. He was good for those quotes. Yeah, he was good. Um, N.T. Wright uh, made a very provocative statement that uh, there's nothing that God is telling us um, through the advent of, of, of a disease like COVID. Agree? Disagree? <laughs> response? Oh, well, he's lost it. I mean, <laughs> uh, God speaks to us and everything, surely. Uh, and you can say, I, what, uh, in fact, I came here from a scripture class, so, and they have no idea where I was going or, or what I'd be talking about. Uh, but one of the students actually asked COVID, is COVID uh, a sign that God's not happy with us? And what did you uh, say? What, what, well, what should we say in response well, it's not to a sign question. of blessing. Uh, I, <laughs> I did take him through the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, and One I of did, them being yeah, plague. Yeah, plague. Yeah, I, I did say down through the ages there have been plagues. And, yeah, COVID uh, compared to the Black Death is, you know, uh, pretty minor so far. Uh, you wouldn't say that to someone who's suffered from it, but, it's, it's you know, in the big picture that's true. Um so I don't want that distorted, but but that's true. Uh, and God chastens us down through the ages various ways. And uh, and then I'm talking to Luke 13, you know, with mm. this, yeah, the, Tower of the Tower of Siloam and people are killed and uh, people make sacrifices with Galileans and they, they, they're killed. And so one is just an accident, the other is by you know, Pilate's troops being a bit testy. Uh, are these the worst people? And Jesus says, no, they're not, they're not the worst sinners. So if something happens, you don't judge that, say, the 230,000 who died in America, they're the worst sinners in America, therefore God has punished them. That's, that's the wrong answer. But to say, as Wright does, it, that this has got nothing to do with God virtually, and uh, the only thing we do, do is support you know, the World Health Organization and do whatever the government tells us to do, and and, and just play the Good Samaritan. That, that's all we can do. It's he, he's, he's nonsense. I mean, Jesus said, if you don't repent, you'll all likewise perish. He is the God of COVID. Mm. He, he is the God of all things. Yeah, that's an interesting point you make, particularly mm. of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because it's the Lord Jesus that breaks the seal to the scroll yes. that unleashes these judgments. Yeah. Have we lost a sense, do you think, today of God being both saviour and judge? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even evangelical circles, people who say they're evangelical, whatever that word means now, 
um, but the idea that God punishes is 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 well, it's not meant to be popular, but it it's not in people's thinking, uh, uh, and so it, you notice with this COVID uh, uh, pandemic, it, it, people aren't saying where is God in this. Mm. Uh, I haven't heard that much. Mm. Where the, there's some sort of sobriety and you know slow down and uh, you know batten down the hatches a bit, but I haven't heard too many religious questions being asked, uh, and. and People have been reluctant to, to go down that track and speak on it. Uh, mm. and, and sometimes with um, not, not totally dishonourable motives, <laughs> yeah, mm. that, that we, we want to be cautious about what we can say. We're not prophets. We're not apostles. Uh, we can't say what It's Moses interesting, said, though, but, isn't it, though? But, uh, one of the um, pastors at Cornerstone said to me the other day he was at a national prayer breakfast, mm. um, and it was obviously via Zoom. And he said he and a number of people there noticed that there was one element in particular that was missing mm. and there was no call on repentance. Yeah. There was no sense of confessing national sin. Um, mm. What is the place, do you think, today in the new covenant for nations being held accountable to God because of their sin? Well, God holds the nations accountable in Amos chapters 1 and 2, doesn't he? The surrounding... Uh Nations of around Israel and Judah, um, as well as in the Book of Isaiah. Yeah, yeah, you know, thirteen to twenty-five. I yeah, think yeah, the oracles against the nations yeah. right, right through the prophets. Uh, so that's God holds nations accountable, and, and the idea that He's holding, you know, Western society accountable for what it's done, uh, it makes perfectly good sense. Mm. And it's offended His moral laws, trampled all over. He doesn't believe Him. Um, he says what's true and what's not, and they they uh, marginalise the Christian faith. It's uh, it's it's put out on the uh, right on the edge if it's loud at all. Yeah, you're allowed to bow your head and pray silently or something, but you can't do anything else. That whole approach. Well, what do you expect? You you can I go back to the? the I didn't answer your question yet about how Christians responded. I think down through the ages, just, mm. just quickly, uh, they did good. Uh, particularly, uh, there's many. Stories, but uh, they they looked after people who had the plague or whatever plague it was, whether it was cholera or whether it was, yeah. So they got involved. Plague. Yeah, they got involved. Uh, they took precautions. Uh, so there was, okay. uh, by and large, there was a looking down on recklessness. Mm. But you had to show courage. Courage mm. is not recklessness, but yeah. But uh, it is a Christian virtue, if I put it like that. And uh, so you took precautions. They obeyed reasonable. Uh, commands from authorities, if there were commands from authorities, and you know, some of those places, civil authority didn't really m count for much because it wasn't strong. Mm. Uh, uh, and they they sort of preached the gospel. The mortality rate we talk about it being high, it's always 100 percent in that sense. You know, everybody <laughs> dies. And Luther says, "Well, this is the reminder. You know, th this is mm. nothing new." And, and Spurgeon makes that same point too. Mm. Uh, and so these they were both involved in plague situations. Mm. Um, Luther more so, but perhaps that uh, uh, that good points to make. The gospel is the answer now. It's the answer pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that note always needs to be sounded. Mm. Uh, Tom Wright just takes out this idea of judgment therefore repentance doesn't come into it uh, because the god of modern culture is just he just cannot be offended mm. everybody in modern culture can be offended mm. but god can't be offended because he's so loving and gracious and kindly <laughs> yeah i mean it's interesting you say that because um just last night i was looking at twitter and um tim keller made a quote uh, yeah. um which i thought has caused quite a stir, actually. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Yeah. But he says, no one has ever learned that he or she is a sinner by being told that they are. Look, I don't know the context. I don't know there was another sentence where he might have said, unless the Holy Spirit is working, mm. they won't see it. So mm. I'm, I'm a bit wary just pulling out one sentence like that. Um, but a lot of people will understand uh, that in the wrong way. I, I, sorry, I don't know what Keller meant. Mm. If, if 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 he just wants to stand by that one sentence as, as it stands, I think that's nonsense. Uh, mm. 
nobody will understand that he is a sinner or she is a sinner unless the Holy Spirit convicts of sin and, and righteousness and judgment. Uh, so that's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. That's true. Um, but the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God and I know I'm a sinner if someone points it out to me or I read it in Scripture and the Holy Spirit testifies that mm. to me, that's where I know I'm wrong. I, I, also, there's a the law of God written on the hearts of everyone. So, so I think we'd all agree that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin mm. and righteousness and judgment. That's exactly what Jesus said. But in terms of our witnessing and our evangelism and indeed our preaching, um, what is the place um, of actually preaching sin and, and therefore judgment? Um, should it, yeah, what sort of priority should it have in our preaching then? In the 18th century revival, Whitfield and Wesley and the others preached sin and repentance and regeneration and atonement through Christ yeah, and resurrection. Good point. They preached the whole counsel of God. I don't think we're going to have any right to say that we're going to truncate it and expect blessing. Um, th there's a way of doing it badly. Uh, of course, that's true. There's a way of just majoring on it, perhaps, but I don't think that's the problem today. I think the problem is that the church is majoring on it and therefore nobody's listening. Mm. It's quite the opposite. The church is largely irrelevant because it's saying what the culture is saying, but um, saying it with a few religious overtones, but that's about it. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we, there's a. You can say to a, a non Christian, that's sin. He, he knows what you mean mm. uh, to some degree. Uh, he might resent it. Well, tough. Mm. Yeah, if, if you're saying it in a way, look, I'm desiring your welfare. You know, th this is just a bit like a doctor who diagnoses yes, cancer. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's doing it so that you can find healing. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, what's the purpose of scripture? Uh, I'm preaching on Second Timothy three sixteen Sunday morning. It, it teaches, it reproves, it corrects, and trains in righteousness. Mm. And Calvin talks about the, 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 the reproof. This is the lancing of the boil. Now, we mm. all know that language. It's true in the physical world. Uh, it, it's true morally and spiritually. You know, we, uh, deception is used so often about mm. sin, isn't it? And we are deceived because sin dresses up self up nicely. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm preaching on Isaiah 40 this weekend. <laughs> and one of the parts in there is, yes, comfort, comfort, comfort my people. Yeah. But then the very next verse goes on to talk about... Um, the, the famous passage that John the Baptist picks mm. up on makes straight yeah. uh, the, yep. the way in the wilderness, which yeah. is a really a call to repentance, isn't it? Yes. Um, and, it and in particular of John the Baptist's ministry, where he even says to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, who told you to repent? Uh, seeker sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. If I can just go back a little bit, and you talked about yeah. the different responses that Christians have made during pandemics, yeah. and that they did submit to the governing authorities, Here's a, a more controversial one. Is there a time that you could see that Christians might not submit oh, yes. to the yeah. governing authorities? And yeah. what sort of things do you see? What What would be the context in which that would occur? I, I, I would think um, where regulations are inconsistent, that, that's, that, that would be one issue. And that, that was an issue particularly uh, during the, the uh, plague in London, uh, just before the, the the Great Fire of London, so you know, in the, uh, uh, 1663, 64, 65, the Great Fire, 66, um, that that some of the regulations were inconsistent, and and that caused some. What do you mean? How were they inconsistent? Um, they, they would board people up in quarantining. They'd, they'd literally board them up and put a guard there. Uh, to make sure the person didn't go out. It's sort of sounding like Victoria. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think, I wonder where that's where you got the idea from. But anyway, uh, that was often done in a clumsy way and did a lot of harm because if you were locked up with someone who had it, well, you had it too and, and mm -hmm. di usually died of it. It was, uh, you didn't use a recover. Um, so that aroused a lot of resentment and was not a good idea. Some of the regulations in the Spanish flu in, in Australia, that they... they they didn't quite know what to do. I think you've got to give authorities a bit of wriggle room, you know, when something hits. And they don't quite know what to do, although Australia usually gets a bit of, unless it originates from Australia. The Spanish flu apparently came from uh, an American military camp. Yeah, it didn't come from Spain it's, at it's, all. I oh, know, yeah, the, the Spanish king caught it. And yeah. And the, the allies and the Axis powers that 
didn't want to acknowledge that their, their troops had it. They were sick, so they, they called the Spanish flu. That seems to be the story. Uh, so it's propaganda. My Fake. wife will be relieved on that because she's from Spain. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, and right. They've been badly maligned. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that people were offended at that. Uh, yeah. Then they just uh, uh, fake news, fake news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but you, I, I don't agree with the the, the idea of um, the Bible says we are to sing, therefore we must sing no matter what. That, that doesn't strike me as convincing. Okay. The Bible says we are to sing, but that's normal circumstances. I'm not allowed, I should not sing if that's going to cause uh, plague to spread. Mm -hmm. Now, now if I think that singing doesn't cause the plague to spread, I have to argue my case. Uh, but don't just assert, you know, Ephesians 5, 19, so God said sing. Mm. Uh, or God says meet together, you know, mm. Hebrews 10. Uh, he, God brings in... Uh, quarantining, if mm. you like, in, with the lepers and Leviticus 13 and 14. So he he, say, he takes it as given that in certain circumstances you won't be able to do, you know, Psalm 122, and I joined into the house of God, go up, they said to me. Okay. Uh, so oh, you, that's you, a good point. You can't do it. Mm. Uh, now, having said that, in a, in a society that had any notion at all, uh, you ought to be looking for people to pray and encouraging that, uh, as much as you could, uh, even in 1919, where I, th I don't think we went off the rails in the 60s, um, or World War One. Uh, this was this is the two devastating uh, causes of modern unbelief. I think it goes back within the church, with biblical criticism coming in in the 1860s. That's when that's when secularization began. Oh yeah, think. yeah, and right. it begins in the church. The problem is always the church. Mm. It works its way out, as it were. What goes on outside is not a major issue if the church is faithful and strong. Uh, if the church has lost it, then what goes on outside just comes right in. Okay, uh, so we, we've faced this massive challenge as a national church. Uh, there's been no, really, no country on earth that has been untouched by this latest pandemic. Mm -hmm. What has this crisis revealed about the church, do you think, at this point? Particularly in the West. <sighs> Well, uh, it's 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 divided. I think it's a civil society. It's it's. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's like the cause of anything. It's just revealed thing. It's symptomatic. It's not. Uh, uh, and uh, the 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 lamenting is, you know, missing. I think. Mm -hmm. um, we we need to meet together, and we need to be working towards that. Uh, what I meant to press on with is. Uh, I, Meeting outside is different to meeting inside. It's, and, and in 1919, the civil authorities took cognizance of that. So they allowed meetings outside. Um, for churches? For, for churches, yeah. Mm. Um, and so... Were they not, were churches in 1919 not allowed to meet inside? Uh, initially, the churches were closed down for a while, yeah. Mm. So that, that took place and there was a lot of argument against it, of course. Uh, and then it was, they were allowed outside. As, and spread apart, and they had to wear masks. And the only one that didn't wear a mask was the preacher. Uh, these days, we're, uh, you know, church has done a bit differently, so we've got all sorts of odd bods and singing and carrying on. Mm. Um, uh, oh, There's different state regulations. Yeah. They're, they're, I think the civil authorities ought to be encouraging churches to meet as much as they can, uh, and how it is that we allow... 40,000 at the football. Mm. Now, I know that's outside, so you, you are comparing apples and oranges. You know, mm. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're yelling and streaming and, and drinking and so on, and and, mm. uh, and a lot of them are playing, paying no attention to social distancing. Mm. Uh, so so you're I, saying as Moderator General that we should build maybe outdoor stadiums for our churches. Is that, <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm saying that... Uh, mm. Yeah, we should be doing our level best to be uh, pressing this issue and pressing it hard and pointing out the inconsistencies mm -hmm. and saying to the authorities, this is not simply an economic issue. You know, the money bring the, the football brings us money. Mm -hmm. The churches don't obviously bring us money, but you're saying there's something more important than that. There's the, you know, the blessing of God who is behind all this 
uh, the God who is obviously not blessing us. <laughs> uh, there's a chastening in this, where, mm. uh, and we seek God's favour in this, and uh, you're not going to get it. In your role as Moderator General, do you feel like you've had um, much of a, a, a platform in which to be able to talk to our government about about these issues? And how have they responded when you have? Well, it's a state issue, and that's more a state. But even a, uh, even on a state level, yeah. yeah I mean, I don't think New South Wales is. Um, I think it's uh, dear Gladys is is uh, hasn't been that hostile, but but uh, more government's indifference. The the church is the last thing in their mind, so they. I think in in other states, there's there's, there's been a more of a hostility there, uh, but. It, but all of them have got the same problem. They are all, yeah, they're ungodly. They pass legislation that's ungodly. They think in an ungodly way. Uh, the gay Mardi Gras is coming up. But that, that, yeah, are they going to curb that? Yes, they will. But they still see it as a, to some degree. But it'll be interesting to see what exactly happens. But they still see it as a good thing. And we need your basic problem. You know, you've got a ungodly basis to law, legislation, mm. to the way the whole society operates, and too many churches go along with it. Just, yeah. Okay, so maybe one final question then, and that is how should we as Christians um, relate and act in the public square in the light of all that you've been discussing? I, I don't think there's any uh, anything except yeah, faithfulness. and uh, We might not be successful. I don't think we're meant to be belligerent, um, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. There's a place for that sort of language, uh, but uh, I'd be hesitant to use it. Uh, <laughs> I think most people would be. But to stand up to governments, it would, I mean, the, the Religious Discrimination Act, you know, the bills that, that's there, and there's a federal one floating around, there's, there's one floating around in the Mark Latham's bill. The idea that you know, you're going to give the Christians a little bit of area where they can have their playground, and they. Uh, but we're not going to protect Israel Folau, and we're not going to protect Julian Porteous from down in uh, Tasmania. Or Campbell Markham. Or Campbell Markham, or. or um, Jarrett Koff. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The, the, forget that. Well, mm. that this won't happen. Well, yeah, it's the whole approach that's wrong. It's, it's not just. There's some aberrations out there. Mm. Uh, God has spoken. There are things that are right and things that are wrong, and and just just swamp it all. With so I've got to ask you that you you raise right. a very important point about mm. the religious freedom bill. Mm. How should we as Christians be? Should we be supporting that? I'd I'd actually think Mark Latham's bill got more going for it, um, which is it's ironic because he's bit, not even a Christian. Yeah, but I think he's a bit tougher and mm. and. Uh, I think he's offering something that's a bit more. So you you take the best you can. Oh, that makes mm. sense to me. I'm pregnant. You, you, you're not ex, you're not saying um, this has to be a, a Christian bill. He, he's giving us as much latitude as is possible. Mm. Um, he sees it, but you're still arguing from a, a wrong basis. There's the, the idea that there are things that are wrong. That are offensive to God, mm. um, the the gay Mardi Gras. Hey, mm -hmm. You're not allowed to, to, to speak against that. Yeah, goodness me, fancy you know, saying nasty things about that. This sort of garbage is why we're where we're at, and mm. it's within the church as well as outside. Mm. And again, a reluctance to call sin sin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm. yeah. You're not. It's it's unloving. Mm. You know, God loves everybody equally. Well, you, you can't get that out of the Bible. Mm. Wow. Well, good challenging words. Um, as Moderator General, I, I've got to give you the last word. Any final word that you think the whole church needs to hear at this time? One one final word of exhortation or encouragement? I've got nothing new to say except that God has spoken to us in the Bible. The Bible is true to Timothy 3.16. Uh, and it reveals to us the eternal son of the eternal father, mm. Christ Jesus. We need to know him. He is life he is salvation. He is truth. Mm. He's everything that we need. He's all sufficient. His grace is all sufficient. Um, his laws are true and, and they have a good effect on us. Uh, everything about God's revelation of himself is true because it comes from him. Uh, and if we know him, we know life. If we don't know him, 
we don't know life. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for joining thank us. You, Mark. Yeah. This has been another edition of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. Uh, I'm glad that I hope you found this episode uh, helpful, and I think there's been something in there for all of us. And I hope to see you next time.